Hello everyone, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Stephen Roth, and I'm a board-certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist, and today we'll be talking about the latest installment in my syndrome series, where we'll be talking about nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, or Gorlin syndrome. But first, we gotta get into the disclaimer, and that is that all of the opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any of the uh, organizations that employ me or that I may belong to. And that also this video is for educational purposes only. Should you have any questions about your oral or systemic health, please seek out your nearest healthcare provider. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. So first, a little bit about the name. Now, I did say two different names at the intro, and that is nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome and the eponymous name, Gorlin syndrome. Gorlin syndrome is named after Robert Gorlin, who is a pioneer in the world of oral and maxillofacial pathology. Dr. Gorlin gave significant contributions to the profession and to the wide, wide general field of genetics in general. In fact, Dr. Gorlin's text on craniofacial syndromes is still very widely used. Dr. Gorlin absolutely deserves to be honored, and there are several ways that we've done that as a profession including twice at our, or at our annual meeting in the Gorlin Award and the Gorlin Honorary Lecture Series. But I personally have an irrational pet peeve with eponyms. In fact, I'm thinking about maybe doing a video about that in the future. It's the video that none of you asked for, but I just gotta talk about it. There are several issues that I have with eponymous entities and syndromes. And it really shows with this syndrome specifically and the name. Now this is Gorlin syndrome, and that's what I'll be spending the video talking about. But there's also the Gorlin sign, which is the ability to touch one's nose with their tongue, which I, I cannot do. But approximately 50% of people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome are able to do that. That, that is a sign of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And then there's also the Gorlin cyst, and the Gorlin cyst is the calcifying adonogenic cyst. There's also Golt's Gorlin syndrome, which is completely different from Gorlin syndrome, which is also sometimes called Gorlin Golt syndrome. So none of these things are related, which make it very, very confusing. So I prefer the non-eponymous nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, although it is quite the mouthful. But with that aside out of the way, I'll be using nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. It's fine if you still want to use Gorlin syndrome, but I certainly have my preference. Nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome affects multiple organ sites, including the skin, the central nervous system, the dentition, and the bones. It is an autosomal dominant uh, syndrome, and the gene affected is the patch gene. Now, I already spoke a little bit about the patch gene before, uh, but it is part of the Sonic the Hedgehog pathway in development. Nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome has variable expressivity, which means that different people with this syndrome may manifest in different ways, and there's not always total overlap. Getting into some of the features, the most relevant to oral pathology and the dentist slash oral surgeon slash oral pathologist is multiple adonogenic keratosis, or OKCs. Multiple OKCs are one of the most common features of this syndrome. In fact, over 85% of people affected by this syndrome will have multiple adonogenic keratocysts. So there are a few things that might tip you off. The first being that if you see multiple radiolucencies in a, a person that you can't explain with something else on a differential diagnosis, then you definitely want to have your eye out for a nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. Another syndrome that I already discussed in my first syndrome series video would be cherubism. The other thing that might have you a little bit suspicious is the age. If you're making a diagnosis of a OKC in a young person, say under the age of 15, then you definitely want to have your radar out for the other signs and symptoms of nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome because OKCs are very, very rare by themselves in young people. One point to mention about the histopathology of these OKCs is that sometimes in some of these cases, a really helpful feature is the multiple satellite cysts or daughter cysts that we see kind of budding off the main cyst lining. 
that kind of gives us a little hint that maybe additional OKCs are trying to form. And so if we have that, we may be able to follow up with a clinician, see if there are other kind of features of the syndrome, and that may lead us to a diagnosis based on the histopathologic findings, not just the clinical findings. The best way to think about nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome is to divide the uh, presentations into different categories. The first being the major categories and the minor categories. And this is what we also use when making the diagnosis of nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. Multiple OKCs is going to be our first major criteria. The next major criteria is where nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome gets its name the basal cell carcinomas. In fact, if a patient has five or more basal cell carcinomas or one basal cell carcinoma before the age of 30, then that is a major criteria for diagnosing this syndrome. Basal cell carcinomas arise because of sun damage. Sun damage is cumulative, meaning that it increases over time. Basal cell carcinomas in the normal population really like the T-zone of our face the forehead, the nose, and the chin. That's because these areas of our face are more prominent and therefore more exposed to the sun. Over time, as we age, that sun damage may lead to a basal cell carcinoma. But in this syndrome, it happens in younger patients and can also happen in areas that aren't sun exposed, which is very uncommon in the general population of patients that have nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. And these basal cell carcinomas can be really difficult to manage because a patient can have hundreds of these and it can lead to tremendous amounts of scarring and disfigurement over time. The next major criteria is lamellar calcification of the Falk cerebri. Now, the brain has two hemispheres and the Falk cerebri is the dura or the covering that runs between the two. Now, in nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, that becomes calcified and we can really appreciate that on coronal sections of a CT or on a head-on radiograph. And you can see it running right down the middle as a calcified line. Another major criteria is two or more palmar or plantar pits. And that is little tiny indentations on the palms or soles of the feet. And then finally, the last major criteria is one or more relative with a diagnosed nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. Now we move on to our minor criteria, which are seen with a little bit less frequency in these patients. The first minor criteria is macrocephaly, and this is seen in a lot of craniofacial syndromes. It just means a larger head. Next is a variety of congenital malformations, including cleft lip and palate, which are also seen in a wide variety of craniofacial syndromes. Uh, hypertelorism, which is wide set eyes, which is also seen in many craniofacial syndromes. The next minor criteria is preaxial or postaxial polydactyly, which means an extra thumb or an extra pinky finger. These patients can have bifid ribs, which means ribs that split. Ovarian or cardiac fibromas are also sometimes seen as a minor criteria in this, these patients. In fact, up to 50% of women that have nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome will also have an ovarian fibroma. Ocular anomalies are another minor criteria with coloboma, cataracts, and microphthalmia, which is smaller eyes. These patients can also get lymphomesenteric or pleural cysts in their mediastinal cavity. And then finally, the last minor criteria is a little bit controversial. There are some people that believe that this minor criteria should actually be moved over to the major criteria, and that is medulloblastoma. Now, medulloblastomas are brain tumors that can be pretty aggressive and often occur in younger patients. Medulloblastomas are categorized in two ways in the WHO, which I have the head and neck version here, but the WHO puts out tumor books for just about every system in the body. And in the brain tumor book, they, they separate medulloblastomas based on architecture and based on genetics and the genes that contribute to it. In pathology, we're kind of moving more towards the gene diagnosis and using genetics to make our diagnosis rather than classic architectural features. But if we're using classical architectural features, then the most common medulloblastoma is the desmoplastic variant. In fact, if a diagnosis of nevoid basal cell carcinoma is made early in life, 
It suggested that these patients are followed every six months with an MRI until they're seven years old to make sure that a medulloblastoma isn't missed because this could be very severe for the patient and may lead to poor patient performance. Many of these medulloblastomas, however, do develop before the age of two, which is very, very young and very sad. So how do you make a diagnosis of nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome? Well, there's three ways. The first is two major criteria. The second is one major criteria and two minor criteria. And the last is one major criteria and genetic confirmation with mutation of the patch gene. Now, it's really important to remember that there is variable expressivity. In fact, my mentor has a father and son that he follows with nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. And what's very interesting is that the father is mostly uh, presents with the basal cell carcinomas. This father has had hundreds of basal cell carcinomas removed and has become quite disfigured, but has never in his life had an adonogenic keratocyst. The son, who's now in his 30s or 40s, has never had a basal cell carcinoma, but has had five or six OKCs removed. So just because these patients are kind of lumped under the same syndrome, doesn't mean that they present in the same way. And that's why there are so many criteria that we use, and it's important to be comfortable with all of them so that you can rule them out. The biggest ones being the adonogenic keratosis, the basal cell carcinomas, and the medulloblastomas, as those may impact the patient's well-being and status the most out of all of the other criteria. Thank you for watching this video. I hope all of you are feeling a little bit better than I am. I definitely have some weird sinus allergy stuff going on, but I really do appreciate you sticking it out to the end of the video. If you liked what you saw, please feel free to drop down there and give the video a like. Share it with someone else that you think might also enjoy this video. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe. It does help push my videos out there to more people. And about 83% of people that watch my videos aren't subscribed yet. So please do so if you have, haven't already. And thank you again for watching. I hope that all of you are well, and I'll see you next time.